Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like first to remind you all that you can send your questions and comments in the comment box here on YouTube. And so moving on to our last lecture of this morning, our next speaker is uh, Professor Manuel Hernandez Pajares. He is a full professor at Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya in Barcelona. He has been working on GPS since 1989 when he was at the Cartographic Institute of Catalonia. Since 1994, he has focused on the on new algorithms for precise ionospheric sounding and GNSS navigation. He has also been the chair of the International GNSS Service Ionosphere uh, Working Group from 2002 to 2007, among other projects and responsibilities. In November uh, 2013, he created and since then has been leading the research group uh, UPC Ionset. Today presenting the lecture, new contributions to the detection of geophysical and astronomical signals with GNSS. Please welcome Professor Manuel Hernandez Pajares. Manuel, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, also, thank you very much to uh, Professor Galera and also the colleagues from, from NESP. To, for the invitation, for, for the kind invitation. I, I hope you can, you can hear me well. Um, so yes. in such a case, also we can, we can go to the presentation. So the presentation is entitled New GNSS Contributions to the Detection of Geophysical and Astronomical Signals. These presentations um, don't try to be, uh, um, let's say, uh, a lecture. It's uh, try to be like uh, a small set of appetizers, uh, and in Spanish tapas, about uh, new uh, contributions we have done recently on these uh, different uh, kind of applications of GNSS uh, that were mentioned before, of course. Uh, for instance, in the in the first presentation of, of Professor Tennyson uh, regarding, for instance, the tropospheric uh, sounding. So uh, this is. Uh, the result of the collaboration of, of many people, and um, yes, they have just written the, the, the first authors of the of the papers, which have which provide more details on these on these uh, works. So, the the uh, I mean, we will focus mostly on three on three uh, contributions. Uh, briefly summarizing them as I have just mentioned, we provide the papers where any interested people can go in details. So the first one is uh, the Genesis uh, Global Genospheric Maps for Vertical Photoelectron Content that surprisingly provide a realistic view of the polar atmosphere. This will be the header, let's say, of the first point. The second um, uh, application that, that uh, we are going to update uh, in the physics and astronomy is uh, that, that, uh, that we call Genesis astronomy uh, might be dramatically extended from the real-time detection and measurement of extra ultraviolet um, fluid rate uh, of surfers, which is now working in real time, uh, to the potential detection of huge surfers. So this is something that we will briefly comment as well, showing less recent results. Um, the third main point is the detection of tsunami associated atmospheric signatures and with GNSS and the potential contribution to forecasting, to potential forecasting. We will also mention other applications, uh, recent applications we have been working on, uh, extending the atmospheric tomography, involving not only GNSS data, but also uh, Doris based uh, data. And involving different kind of receivers, uh, ground based, Leo based, and vessel based. The detection of uh, ground information under sudden river, river flow increase, and also uh, um, the capability of GNSS to provide uh, consistent gradients, tropospheric gradients, uh, in the, um, before the hurricanes or in the context of hurricanes. These points B and C are in the context uh, were mentioned before by Professor Tevinsen of the other applications of PPP. Um, and uh, the last point is uh, low cost fixing of satellites. So it's uh, maybe, uh, I guess, an interesting 
uh, capability of very cheap uh, local receivers, which are able to provide not just detection, but also uh, you can fix the most part of the secure slips with an improvement on the corresponding single frequency PPP. So, um, so let's go. So uh, the first point, uh, I mean, um, in, I am not going to provide uh, to all in details, but likely many of you know that the International Genesis Service uh, is providing uh, different products for the community um, in diff different latencies. Also, uh, recently in real time as well, or in the last years in real time as well. Obviously, satellite uh, clock error estimations, orbital or satellite orbits, precise orbits are the most uh, very well known, but also um, global illustrated maps, and also recently uh, as well in, in real time in an experimental uh, mode. So in our case, in our research group in U UPC Yonsat, we are applying uh, from the beginning of IES uh, a strategy which is based on the tomography, on voxel-based tomography, and using only carry phase data. Um, we can do that because we can estimate simultaneously the mean electron densities inside each voxel, illuminated voxel, and the carry phase uh, bias or carry phase ambiguity. So, uh, due to the chain of the geometry, similarly as the tropospheric delay, the semi tropospheric delay can be estimated and separated, for instance, from the cor uh, radial coordinate. Yeah. So, um, this, uh, so, the question is that uh, we were not looking at the polar regions. Many people, many, I guess that the most part of the community, we were thinking that the polar regions of the lower ionospheric maps are quite boring because uh, likely the default assumption is that there are, that's true. There are a few stations, so everything is quite flat and likely not realistic. So, but we saw some, some signatures in, in time to time that brings our attention and we have studied in detail what is the quality of the what is the real, uh, not only not that just the quality? What is the degree of realistic representation of the genes for the polar regions, which is something which is of interest now, especially in, in the polar regions. Um, uh, there is a high interest, as you know. So um, the first that we did is to to check the the the, the accuracy of the of the genes in the polar regions, north polar regions, south polar regions. We use in this case as well uh, we take as metrics the standard deviation versus the uh, altimeter, independent altimeter uh, detect, null frequency altimeter, in this case, is on, is on one, is on two, is on three. And uh, we did this from most than one solar cycle. And um, we checked that our gym, UQRG, is also performing well, uh, similarly that in global. So, uh, so we decided to, to study with all 15 minutes uh, gyms to, to see what is the what is the, the, the degree of of visibility of of the of the polar ionosphere uh, given by the gyms. Uh, in our approach, we are using tomography as we have just mentioned, but also cleaning for interpolating, which works quite well because take, takes into account the error the correlation lengths in the interpolation. So um, I just some examples. There are a couple of examples that we can find. Uh, this is a a Lambert projection at the left of in um, this is in the uh, north polar region in in a wide sense. I mean we are representing from 40 degrees uh, in this case to the north of 40 degrees. Of course, 40 degrees, 50 degrees is not polar region, but in this way we can see very well the borders and um, to be relaxed regarding to the changes in the magnetic uh, latitude. Um, yeah, so. Uh, so, uh, for instance, we can see here, this is a depression here. This is the polar trough, which is a very well-known uh, feature or the polar uh, ionosphere. And which we can see at the same time from the tomography. Uh, red means uh, high electron content at the second layer, at the top. The top electron content is high or the top electron density is higher. So uh, it's coincident with uh, a higher distribution of the, of the electron density associated Likely with an increase of the scalp height and increase of temperature. So this is one of the several different um, phenomena that are have been studied in a consistent way with models and in a consistent way with higher resolution 
uh, uh, GNSS data uh, and also with um, with uh, other instruments uh, like, for instance, in the next slide, the uh, the the image satellite uh, in a far ultraviolet image at the left. This corresponds to the South Polar Region. So uh, here it is seen uh, the so-called Theta Aurora phenomenon with a uh, transpolar arc uh, of plasma, and uh, we we get something which is compatible here as well. Uh, the the, the right-hand plot is a, a bit rotated. This is the closer one, closer to the collocated uh, to the satellite. And in the in the manuscript in the paper, we can see ma many more examples, more clear examples. But this is the diet comparison at the same time, more or less, between both both uh, genes. So there are many many examples in this sense, with different phenomena, uh, also in geomagnetic storms, major storms, and so on. It, that sometimes have a very important effect at the north, like the Halloween storm, like uh, at the high latitudes, um, as well due to also to the connection or the connection with the, the solar magnetic field, interplanetary magnetic field. So. Um, but also that we have done during this more than one solar cycle is to 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 make an unsupervised clustering of the of the polar gyms. And this is for the North Pole, and um, this corresponds every two hours. So there are twelve. Uh, that is like two two blocks. So three columns: the first block every two hours, and the second block as well every two hours. And um, and this the the one of each one of these columns corresponds to the uh, most uh, frequent clusters in the unsupervised clustering done with a, a neural network, a classical neural network technique, instead of organizing maps. So this corresponds to to the, the, the let's say the representatives of every cluster. And um, so we have been able to, in other words, to characterize the climatology of the North Pole and also the South uh, Pole genosphere as well. Um, and this also we are able for every family of clusters, every of these three main families of, cast, of clusters, we're able to, to see what is the predominant season, um, uh, local summer, local equinox, uh, local winter, uh, if it happens during the cold solar cycle or it's more predominant in solar mass or in solar mean. And either we can see uh, the distribution of the the fractional part of the top side electron content which provide is one way to improve the mapping function which has been studied in previous works that, that we call new to. So uh, I mean there is plenty of information this is for the South Pole really to be to be used and to be exploited for other purposes for instance for improving the, the position. More details can be found uh, here can be found in this paper uh, that has been published this year in the Journal of Physical Research, Space Physics. Okay, so this is the first contribution. Um, so let's go to the second one uh, that uh, we can say Genesis Astronomy from real-time solar UV flux rate measurements to stellar flare detection. So this is very challenging. This is the most challenging uh, work. Um, also, I have to recognize that uh, connect with my previous, uh, let's say, scientific reincarnation before uh, UFC and DNSS. But um, in few words, uh, if we consider um, global um, dual frequency measurements, dual carrier phase, um, uh, we can consider uh, geometry free combination of carrier phases, for instance, L1 minus L2, for instance, in GPS in length units. So, as you know, um, this except in the higher order tens, which is typically less than 1,000. Um, so, um, so, so uh, that you can, that you have is with a uh, geometry combination of, free combination of carrier phases, you have something which is this ambiguous slanticity, the slanticity plus phase bias or phase ambiguity. So you can perform a, a detrending. If you have uh, properly detected cycle slips, we will talk at the last point about uh, this uh, new uh, technique with low-cost receivers. So you are able to, to detect properly cyclic slips. So you can consider, for instance, second 
time differences, like a very simple way of performing uh, a fast rate de trending. So if you do that, and uh, you represent the detrended um, the detrended uh, VTEC vertical PC using a mapping function, um, standard mapping function, assuming, for instance, a uh, thin uh, spherical layer um, with a high enough elevation mass to avoid high, high errors. So, and you represent this, they trend that uh, globally distributed from a global network, for instance, of 200, 300 stations, um, versus the, the cos cosinus of, uh, of the solar cenit angle. When uh, a surfer happens, we get this clear pattern. This corresponds to a strong surfer, a very strong surfer, the one, one, the one for the Halloween storm, 28, preceding the Halloween storm, 28 October 2003. So we see this very clear. Uh, uh, this is for positive cosinus of solar cenit angle. So this means day side, day side hemisphere. So in the day side, there is a, almost linear increase of uh, the detrended VTEC regarding to just to the cosine, cosine of the solar cenit angle. Uh, very simple physics, very, very simple first principles uh, explain that this is the expected behavior because it's very fast, the over ionization. And also that the slope should be proportional with physical constant should be proportional to the extreme ultraviolet uh, flux rate from the sun, because the extreme ultraviolet is the most effective part of the solar radiation in the ionosphere. It's the main responsible for the ionization in the F layer. So, so this is that we get. So the slope we can we can compare the slope with the direct UV. Uh, flux rate measurements directly from satellites with photometers pointing to the sun, because this is obtained indirectly with lenses and looking at the effect on the ionosphere, the sudden, the sudden over ionization. So, uh, with a very simple model, as I told you, uh, we have this linear relationship, and this it, it fits very well. In blue is the same measurements for uh, the slope. Every point is one slope. So it's every time, every epoch. Um, and this is for, for this, the same uh, flare, but uh, analyzing many flares, uh, strong, mid, and weak, for the last uh, uh, solar cycle, we get a very nice correlation between the, uh, the diet measurements from the satellites of the same instrument, uh, the photometer, solar photometer, regarding to the indirect measurements with the NSS. So the question is, can we have a dream? Can we Think that maybe this might be accurate enough, sensitive enough to detect stellar flares, which is something very, very challenging because the stellar flares can be much more stronger than the sun, but the distances are much more larger. Also, we have other phenomena that we are not going to, to comment now, but that also co provide a strong signature of UV um, flux rate. So, that we need is to modify the, the technique to, uh, because we need to estimate as well the position of the source. So in a very simple mathematics, we uh, transform the, uh, the equation in a, an equation with four unknowns, alpha, beta, gamma, and B. And uh, in this way, we are able to estimate the position of the source. So testing this technique with different solar sources, solar flares, without uh, using the, the well, very well-known position of the sun, we have been able to, to characterize that for a strong flares, for strong flares, we can get typically errors, of course, very strong flares uh, from the sun, which is very close to us. We get typically errors of up to a few degrees. But for weaker flares, we can get, we have larger errors with the present version of the technique. So the, the next thing that we did is to analyze two stellar flares. And we, did, we detected uh, the collocation, uh, the time and the position, approximate position, for instance, in, in one of the two cases for Proxima Centauri, for a stellar flare that happened in 2016 and was possible to see by naked eye this stellar flare, the, the increase of bright of the Proxima Centauri. So, after detecting uh, with the, this technique, uh, after obtaining the approximate position with about 10 degrees of error and the approximate time of the, of the flare that was recorded by astronomical observations. We also we went to the stellar points here, and we were able to see because the flare is at 8:32, so this is 8.5. I should have indicated 
indicate it's more or less is in my in my arrow. I hope you can see my arrow. Um, is uh, more or less a bit more than 8.5 hours. So it's quite, it's coinciding as well with this small increase of over uh, on the over ionization. So um, also the mean trend of of after smoothing is quite compatible with the light curve measured directly from astronomical uh, obser observations. Um, yeah. So more details can be found in in this space paper in Space Weather published this year. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to another appetizer, hopefully, um, regarding applications to the uh, physics and astronomy. So this is for uh, Genesis tsunami detection and propagation from associated atmospheric waves. Um, this is one study uh, presented in uh, done about the talk, very well known talk, earthquake in Japan in 2010. Um, and the, the earthquake happened is the epicenter is indicated in this red star. You can see my my pointer. And um, the, the good uh, the good the, the almost unique uh, uh, very good scenario we have as you very well know is a high dense GeoNet network of permanent ground um, GNSS receivers. So um, what? We can see, for instance, from the more direct to most elaborated uh, way of of processing the the data to try to get useful information about the the tsunami uh, existence and also the potential uh, warning of tsunami uh, potential issue of a tsunami warning. The first very simple thing is to look directly at the raw data, uh, just doing the geometric free combination, the geometric combination, or one minus all two in length units for DPS. And this is the, the line indicates the, the earthquake, the main shock. And you can see the this is uh, directly the, the slant is see without the trend. But directly in this case was not very uh, high variation. So it was very clear this N shape coinciding uh, typically with um, the acoustic uh, waves. And later on, these oscillations, which are typical of uh, Tsunami-related uh, TIDs, uh, traveling stream disturbances. So this can be seen directly from the data. So this is, and also you can do something a bit more elaborated, which is a theorem, uh, as it is well known in, for for geophysics, representing the the detrended values of the VTEC uh, in the plot distance versus UT, uh, distance to the epicenter. So uh, positive slope. Uh, uh, straight lines means uh, likely uh, circular propagation of a wave from the from the from the center, and this can be done at different frequencies. So looking at different parts of the, the TID spectrum, but GeoNet also provides, of course, the possibility to see directly the movie uh, with the, so many pierce points from the more than one thousand permanent receivers in Japan. So this, of course, this allows to see very well the different waves. And what else can be done? So that we have developed is the ATID. Um, so this technique, uh, based on the atomic decomposition, allows to estimate and um, simultaneous different TIDs that are happening, and also the propagation parameters without any a priori assumption. So this is quite uh, quite useful uh, regarding to the classical previous techniques where we, you were assuming a single planar wave TID. And uh, in this way, for instance, we are able to estimate all the different pr uh, propagation parameters. In particular, the velocity, for instance, the velocity. Uh, you can see here the dashed line is uh, the line corresponding to the main shock in time uh, for the top earthquake. And uh, you can see like appears the activity later on, that is that we have seen directly in the raw data before. But here we have velocity versus time. So you can, for instance, see in the F sector, this is one of the sectors, the F sector, how appears velocity which is increasing with the time in this uh, blue, uh, upper blue um, uh, distribution of, of waves. And uh, especially in F, a little bit in H, but especially in F. And if we go to the map, the the F region for the ATPs corresponds to the open C. So this is corresponding to the, this is consistent, compatible with the one tsunami wave, the 
the Yosuit signal to the quad tsunami wave, which is moving to the deep sea. So when it is increasing, the deep sea means, as you know, uh, the velocity of the of the tsunami uh, on this on the sea increase. Um, when the deep the, the depth of, of the of the sea floor uh, is uh, is increased, um, the reversal of course. If, when the tsunami goes to the close to the to the shore, the, the velocity decreases because it's transforming potential energy, increasing the height of the wave of the tsunami. So uh, this allows to estimate uh, a signature of the tsunami. This in, this velocity evolving according to the bathymetry, and also might allow, in this case, uh, depending on the uh, location of the population uh, areas, this might allow to provide a warning. In, if we had, maybe this was not the case here, because um, the, uh, there are not, uh, the most part of the population was towards the, 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 the west, but if at the east we had uh, likely some islands, so it could be provide a warning based on this of this technique. Uh, this technique is able to, uh, to, to, to work in real time, and we are adapting it for, for working with uh, less dense uh, networks, like uh, in Chile or Argentina. We have applied very recently to the Chile uh, EAP earthquake and tsunami. And the details uh, can be found in this paper uh, in remote sensing published um, last year. Yeah. OK. So the three main contributions have been very briefly described. So, so let's go to the small, um, uh, still shorter contributions uh, from the point of view of providing just a glance. Uh, in the same line, applications of the NSS, uh, mostly for your physics and, and in particular, uh, but also we'll talk a little bit about in the last about um, the, this uh, low cost cyclist technique detection and fiction technique. So uh, the next uh, work was to try to move to to bring the the the, the tomography the unstrained tomography as I told me, uh, I told before combining um, different kind of of leos. Uh, uh, different, sorry, the perceivers on board Leos, on board vessels, on ground stations, and also either different geodetic systems, not just GNSS, in this case GPS and Galileo, but also Doris data. And in the same in the same model, with the same using only calorie data, which makes the light very easy because you can avoid the silver range, which is uh, not only quite noisier, but also uh, you avoid to enter in the uh, BGDs, DCBs, in the instrumental biases. So you, you just focus on estimating um, estimating the, the phase bias by, by geometric decorrelation in the context of a Kalman filter uh, to solve the electron density of the voxels and the phase biases. And this is, uh, for instance, a list of, of the receivers, including one receiver in this vessel, in uh, Maria Merian, in the north, in the north, um, in the north of Europe. So. Um, that we uh, did is to compare our UQRG uh, gym, which is which, uh, our gym, which is becoming a bit better and is one of the best of the best in, in the years. Um, looking at the standard deviation of the regarding to to deviation to the altimetry, that is something that we have studied in detail before. This is a good performance number, external uh, error estimation. And uh, comparing with um, uh, for this for one day, in, this corresponds to the to 156, 2017, and uh, doing different different um, uh, different combinations of data. So, for instance, we can see a significant reduction of the error in this that we call U, UGDP. UGDP means combining long GPS Doppler. Um, Doppler means, um, 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 I mean, uh, yeah, um, um, Doris, sorry, the, uh, the Doris is entirely Doppler based, um, Doris data and also uh, Leo data. So the U UGDP, Leo POD data, the Leo data comes from the receivers uh, for pre precise orbit determination pointing towards, not, not for the locations, just observations above the local horizon of the LEO. 
So uh, here the, the improvement is, is significant. It's, uh, it's from 205 DC units to 1.99. And um, okay, and um, uh, so so this is something interesting. Uh, combining all this kind of data, we we can still improve a little bit the the best behaving gene during, for instance, this day of of analysis. Of course, uh, more uh, better um, uh, higher um, improvement is obtained uh, locally. Uh, also, we we compare, for instance, um, we, this this corresponds to the the ground track corresponds to the JSON three track, the ultimate of the external reference for for assessing our results, and also we use independent receivers not used in the gene uh, estimation to apply another test, which is more sensitive, it's more precise, the DSTEP test. And uh, we, we were able to see the, the positive impact of adding data from the vessel in this region, uh, in the, over the sea, a bit far from non receivers. There are something, of course, these are, this is a first proof of concept of this, uh, this multi-tomographic um, approach. Yeah. More details can be found in, in this paper in Journal of Geodesy published this year. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, another uh, application to geophysics. <laughs> this corresponds to, it's called, in, at least in Argentina, the Sudestal. The Sudestal. Um, there is a geophysical uh, phenomenon uh, that at the end is translated in an increase of the of the height water height of the La Plata River, in you can see the water height in, in green. Sorry, in green. Um, so from 70 to 78, day 78 to day 79 of 2016, there was an important increase of the water height of about maybe two meters. And at the same time, we were lucky because we have one station Montevideo, uh, MTB one one permanent receiver. Uh, GPS receiver with an atomic clock. So uh, the, the time was given by an atomic clock. So this was an excellent uh, opportunity because at the same time um, in, in the team um, there was uh, 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 research going on regarding the, the uh, elasticity or the usage of empirical elasticity param parameters to describe the 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 subsidence so the impact on the radial coordinate so that we did was the following we modify our software the same tomographic uh, software for the geosphere is also implementing the version to implementing the geometric modeling for for clocks uh, troposphere um, positioning and uh, that we did was to uh, process basically um, in white noise, uh, processing the, the estimating the receiver clock in uh, Montevideo as a white noise, comparing with the processing the uh, receiver clock in Montevideo in our, let's say, improved PPP model uh, uh, in a constrained uh, way, taking profit that it was driven by a, an atomic clock. And we characterize the process noise that we could use with what kind of memory was the realistic memory for the uh, random walk process noise that we implemented in our PPP for solving the receiver uh, error. So um, we did a several tests, but you can see, uh, and we estimate directly the impact, not, not we don't even estimate the, the, the radial coordinate, we estimate the empirical um, elasticity uh, parameter. Uh, could provide directly um, the impact linearly on the radial coordinate. And we neglected the impact on the horizontal coordinate, which was much smaller of this phenomenon. So we found something very nice that uh, using the memory for the atomic clock in the, in the GPS receiver, we get a very clear signal, uh, coinciding with the, with the increase of the, the water height, 78 to 79. And we estimated the parameter consistently with the expected values from, from the physics, with a uh, model of Young and a Poisson parameter. So we, we got this consistently. 
And doing without memory, we get a flatter and not so uh, nice result. The, the signature was not clear, and the estimated parameter was um, significantly different from the expected value from the physics. So this was basically the, the result. Uh, in the, there are more things, but this is the, the main, maybe one of, of the main results in this paper that was published last year in EP Solutions, where you can find more, more details. OK. Let's move uh, forward. Um, uh, in the same line that was commented by Professor Teonisin at the beginning, uh, PPP not just for positioning, like in this case that I have just mentioned for the subscala phenomena, um, also for the hurricanes. So uh, also last year we uh, we published as well uh, uh, the results of uh, in the Harvey uh, hurricane in 2017 which was quite um, uh, was uh, a good opportunity because happened over a, a region, the south of USA, with uh, uh, an important or a significant permanent network from Genesis receivers. So basically, uh, I'm not going to, want to enter in details. The, the same type of delay, as you see, it is well known, can be described uh, as well, not just with a single value at the center of the receiver, but also a gradient component in um, in, uh, in the horizontal gradient component. So um, that we have done in our software first was to check that our implementation was working reasonable well. So we were able to conf to confront to, to compare with with uh, external um, um, results from the. Um, uh, um, they play with uh, results in the University of Nevada, with Reynolds and uh, um, gradients, and the argument was quite quite good. And this uh, allowed us to make uh, an application details and skipping the details because my intention is just to provoke you in the sense that you can maybe if you are interested you can have interest to to, to read more details in the in the papers. Is that uh, we comparing um, with uh, uh, information, the information provided by the by the by the uh, weather um, uh, models, uh, we got uh, consistent uh, gradients, topospheric gradients, especially before the arrival of the of the hurricane. So we explain how we interpreted that, and in other words, the the scenic, uh, the genesis. Uh, this is another another example that the genesis can contribute to the the meteorology, so that the GPS meteorology is uh, is is not is not is is true. I mean, it's something which is useful. Okay, um, the details are already published last year in this paper in Earth and Space Science Journal, and um, the last the last. Okay. So um, the, we go to low-cost uh, receivers. Low-cost means one receiver, in this case, that the cost was um, um, about a few hundred of euros, was uh, one receiver um, manufactured, uh, assembled by Rokugun company, a small company in Barcelona, Rokugun SL. And that was using a ULOX um, single frequency um, um, uh, chipset. And the next thing is that this uh, low cost receiver is able to work at 5 Hz and Ether at 10 Hz. So, um, when we consider uh, the curve phase uh, model, single frequency, uh, this is the available now expression, uh, the ionospheric delay, the troposphere delay, the distance, and so on, the wind up, the ambiguity. Um, so, um, instrumental delays. Uh, the question is that also uh, this receiver, um, as in particular, uh, provide Doppler measurements. So, as you know, the kind of phase is the integrated Doppler. So, this explains very well why. And then exist uh, the phase bias is the initial unknown value in the integration of the Doppler when the current phase is locked, um, and so on. So the Doppler follows uh, has different contributions. Of course, the pure 
Doppler contribution, the MFT one, the chain of distance, but also the contribution from the clocks, especially the visible clock, the, the contribution from the chain of the Islandian straight delay and purposely Islam purpose delay, a sort of small contribution of the lineup. And um, so the question is uh, we can subtract both. I mean, when there is a cycle slip, I will tell you in a different way. When there is a sudden cycle slip, a cycle slip that happens, is the lock is lost just a fraction of time, and the receiver lock quickly again the signal, but the ambiguity has changed. This change in ambiguity is uh, expected to be a uh, multiple of the wavelengths. So this is expressing the, this equation three. So that the, the approach is very simple. That was, I mean, um, uh, was very simple. This subtracting from the chain of the of the carry phase, for instance, a five hertz high rate or ten hertz, uh, subtracting the the value provided by the Doppler. Doppler means, uh, for instance, the mean Doppler multiplied by the intern interval. So what happens if, the, for instance, the receiver clock error uh, behaves more or less linearly between epochs, between times, uh, taking the average, we will be able to proper deal with this linear trend of the receiver clock error. The receiver clock error is a low cost receiver, so it should be quite, quite bad, but this to, to prevent that, we need to work at high rate. And um, in our experience, five hertz at least, 10 hertz as well, of course, better. One hertz is in the lining. So uh, I, I was, I was, uh, I had for a uh, familiar reasons, I had to travel to Iceland two years ago, just two years ago, December 19, uh, to, 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 to help my, my son to, to come back to Spain after one year working at Akureyri, the north of Iceland. So I decided to bring my two small receivers, as you can see here, there, and because uh, and because Akureyri uh, is Iceland means scintillation typically. Uh, we have high probability of significant scintillation. We are close. We are in the uh, polar north polar hemisphere, so we have dispatches that we have seen before, and uh, that tends to produce scintillation. And also uh, uh, in my hotel, I have this internal patio. <laughs> And I, I saw a, an excellent urban canyon here. So urban canyon plant scintillation, this is that I was looking for many cyclists and to, to see what was the capability to detect them, to have a high statistics. So um, I have I have to warn to the to the very kind person in charge of the hotel that the blinking light was something peaceful, nothing dangerous because uh, was 70 hours uh, with a blinking uh, red light uh, working before the battery is exhausted. So this was the difference. The difference between the both the chain of, of phase and the and the Doppler mean Doppler uh, measurement by the time interval at five hertz. And the horizontal is the difference in length in, in wavelengths of L1, single frequency receiver L1 GPS L1. And this is the y-axis is the semi-logarithmic number of measurements. So we had, so all the, the difference were clustered around the wavelengths. So this mean, uh, uh, as we check, that we were able not only to detect the cycle slips, the most part at five hertz at least, the most part of them with differences uh, significantly larger than half cycle, but also we were able to fix them. We were able to see how many interior numbers uh, jump the, the ambiguity and to correct them. This was the key. If we do that, we can do single frequency plus precise point positioning. So it's that we did here in blue, uh, not um, not fixing the cycle slips, just flagging them, but not correcting them, and in red correcting them. So the impact is very clear. We have a very high improvement in in uh, convergence time and accuracy under a strong scintillation or a strong, let's say, cycle slip scenario like we have. More details can be found in this paper uh, published uh, this year in GPS Solutions. Um, that's all. Uh, just to summarize, we have presented recent contributions to extend the applications of EMSS in geophysics, astronomy, and low cost positioning. First, the capability of the detailed genes for representing actual features of the polar genosphere and the generation of the climatological model. 
Um, now this research continues in, in the first world ESA funded project here in, in Europe. Secondly, uh, the potential extension of GNSS as an UV photometer for, from solar flares to solar flares. Solar flares is already working for the Space Awareness uh, Program of the European Commission. And for solar flares, we have a new uh, funded project to be, uh, ESA funded project to be started in June from the European Space Agency on, on this target. And the third point is the usage of the GNSS to detect and characterize the propagation of different TLBs associated to tsunami. This research continues now in the cost of a funded project. And, and also, uh, we have uh, um, mentioned uh, recent contributions of, about the benefits of combining multi geodetic uh, measurements with different kinds of receivers for the atmospheric tomography. Uh, the continuation of the research might, might continue in a new project, which is selected for negotiation. And point B, the usage of low receivers connected to atomic clocks allows the decorrelation of receiver clock error from radial coordinate and topospheric estimations, which allows a most accurate determination of the uh, impact of the uh, river, of the river sea, uh, sorry, river flood uh, increase of the uh, river uh, water level on the coordinates. Um, Moreover, the precise genesis modeling uh, of the topospheric gradients are soundless and also are, can be helpful for the complementing the study of the hurricanes. And the last point, low-cost single-frequency receivers allows to detect and fix the most part of circular slips, either in the atmospheric scintillation and urban canyon scenario, with the associated benefit in precise positioning. Um, well, I forgot to include the sentence. Thank you, but I tell you thank you for your for 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 your audience. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Manuel, for your presentation. It's always a pleasure to hear you and <laughs> learn with you. Uh, we have some questions from our audience. The first one, I think you will remember the name, Fabrizio Pro. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, uh, hi, Manuel, uh, are the products, uh, are the UPC uh, products, including the VTEC values above uh, 87.5 uh, degrees in terms of latitude in the IONX files? If not, are the polar genes from UPC available at the IGS servers? Many thanks. Yes, um, I mean, uh, the answer is, is, uh, is no and yes. I mean, um, the the, the voxels or the for the VTEC, uh, we are following the, the resolution, the common resolution agreed in IGS. So this means from minus 87.5 to plus 87.5 every 2.5 degrees in latitude in particular. But these voxels, which are very close, as you know, because we are very close to the pole, so the, dist the, the, the distance is quite close. These voxels are in our approach are um, interpolated after. Um, Estimating the, the voxels, uh, um, applying always the neatest uh, voxel center to the given line of sight. So every line of sight illuminate one voxel. So it can be a farther away. There is a line limit, of course, not to take too farther away uh, 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 line of sights. But um, in other words, these voxels, these pixels at 87.5, are including, um, let's say, the, the information, uh, the, the, the smooth information about the poles itself. So there are no more from our side with not more resolution, but they could be built with high resolution using the YOSA tools that we, you may remember that we applied in, in the lecture in, in Presidente Prudente, uh, I guess yes. two years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, it's true, Fabrizio also asked uh, regarding the ionospheric tomography combining much GNSS and much space instruments. How stable are the receiver DCBs of the vessels? Okay, the, the good thing is that we don't need to we don't estimate the receiver DCB because we don't we, we don't use the settlement. Okay. So the, the DCBs and the DCBs are computed as a byproduct as a post residual. We saw the model, we, we, we estimate for the mean electron densities and for the carrier phase biases, 
And afterwards, of course, with this, this model, with this, or uh, if we interpolate a bitmap map or we consider a dual layer model or a um, neutral whatever, so we can um, compute the slant C uh, for every observation and subtract it in. For instance, we can subtract the, the slant TC from the model that we have solved with colored phase only data to the geometry free combination of several ranges. And in this way, we can compute the DCBs. And yeah, this, they are quite stable and quite compatible with, uh, with other. Uh, uh, other DCBs and also for, for Genesis, we have looked in also in multi Genesis one year ago. We have not published this uh, comparison yet, but yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, another, sorry, uh, another question from Fabio Becker from INTI Do you think that it is possible uh, to use the same procedure you use to analyze the tropospheric effects of uh, Hervey hurricane? To tropical thunderstorms perturbations. To, to do what? Sorry, to do. To, to do the same. Uh, to apply the same procedure, but uh, to identify tropical thunderstorms perturbations. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, the answer uh, you can imagine is to try it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I have actually one question that it's, uh, I don't know if is more or less in the same way, but uh, about the detection of hurricanes, uh, do you know some study or something like this uh, relating the, the, the need for a really dense uh, network, GNSS network? Because as you know, all applications that we need a really dense network for the Brazilian region, we have some limitations. So all applications that really rely on dense uh, GNSS networks, for us, it's like uh, something that it's harder. So do you know this relation, if there is something that is already known? I mean, uh, this is, uh, I, uh, I maybe I didn't emphasize, uh, this has been done with PPP, I mean. Oh, okay. So you can just apply it only to, with one station, but no. of course, uh, of course, to, to to be able to 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 play and to compare, you need more stations to be able to see the compatibility with uh, the weather for uh, the weather models and uh, the measurements, other measurements. But uh, you don't need um, dense network; just one station, PPP. Okay, so it's possible to apply. Okay. Yes. Uh, we have another question from Leonardo Castro de Oliveira. Uh, hi, Manuel. Any experience with monitoring volcanic activities? <laughs> uh, not yet. Um, um, so many of you, but it's still there. Not there. yet. Uh, it was told. It was told with some colleagues in, in Barcelona. Maybe half year, uh, before the, the COVID, it was told to do uh, to try to study some some data in Canary Island with some volcano. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, for, uh, uh, we have recently analyzed uh, one, uh, the, the launch of one scientific ro rocket, the one cosmic one scientific rocket was launched. And um, I mean, in other words, uh, the tomographic uh, uh, approach at least, of course, is not the only one, allows to, uh, seems to us that uh, allows to directly estimate 40 gradients uh, quite well and quite consistently. So it will be very interesting to study a volcano, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> With a, at least a, a little bit. Okay, so I'd like to thank you again, Manuel, for your availability to always be collaborating with our research group with uh, presentations and with visits in Brazil, receiving students <laughs> in your research group and for everything so thanks a lot thank you very much to you for your kind invitation also i wish you merry merry christmas and healthy new year <laughs> 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 and i'd like also to thank you all